welcome everyone to our first fireside chat. Um, we're super honored and happy to have Rosaline today with us. She is the CEO and co-founder um, and founder, sorry, um, of uh, CXA. Um, and she's been on it for quite some time. Her team has grown to over 300 people now and um, have been in some really, really cool developments that maybe she can talk a bit more about. Um, so yeah, welcome, Rosaline. Um, maybe if you want to quickly introduce yourself and talk a bit about your current work. Yeah, so um, I run an insure tech uh, startup. And right now, we're working with Goldman Sachs to try to raise 100 million US in our Series C. So kind of exciting. I've never really raised money through Zoom. <laughs> we always had to meet investors in person for our series A and B, but this time this is Zoom fundraising. So, you know, it's it's all new during COVID. Actually really curious, what is it what is it like to do Zoom fundraising? Yeah, so um Actually, you can see people's reactions right in their face. So it's kind of neater. And because the slides are right there, um, people actually are more focused. So I, I, I find that, you know, you can actually do a lot more in Zoom fundraising than you do driving everywhere. <laughs> so it's neater, but now they can't visit my office to feel the vibe because no one's in the mm. office. <laughs> so right. it is completely different. But what's neat is COVID actually accelerated our growth. Mm. What the industry discovered during COVID is no one wants to see an insurance agent face to face. Most of my clients are banks. No one wants to walk into a branch face to face. Everyone cares about healthcare. And because of the economic downturn, everyone needs you know, digital health and insurance to be discounted, right? Because there's, you know, everyone's looking for cost savings. So we're in the right place at the right time. Exciting, yeah. it's, it's exciting for us. Definitely. Um, I think with, with a lot of these sort of like challenges that occur, like a lot of opportunities also arise and it seems like um, you sort of were able to sail that wave pretty well. Um, but before we actually go a bit deeper into that, just wanted to let everyone know that if you, this is a fireside chat, meaning that if anyone has any questions or whatsoever, or any points that people would like to see uh, be discussed, please either um, send me a message or write it in the Q&A or in the public Q&A where we can moderate that and um, and uh, go through it. But yeah, so anyways, that aside, um, let us come back to, uh, to sort of entrepreneurship, your career. Um, I know uh, you wanted to sort of talk a bit about the lessons that you've learned, obviously a lot of entrepreneurs have like a lot of ups and downs, um, would love to sort of hear a bit more from, especially from the start, um, since a lot of us are students, um, college, actually we're all college students. Um, and a lot of us have questions around like entrepreneurship, like how do you start something? Um, should you start it during this time? Or sort of what are the skills that you need to um, accumulate to do something well and to perform well. Um, I know these are so many topics, but really yes. start wherever you feel comfortable. Yeah. So when I was in college, I was an engineering major. Um, I didn't know that I would later start a startup, right? I was just trying to get through my classes because I didn't really like engineering. <laughs> so, um, and I only studied engineering because when I was young, I babysat for an engineer and I was super poor and they were the first people I saw with a two-story house. So <laughs> that's the only reason I studied engineering because I, I grew up in the ghettos of, of LA. Um, so in college, I didn't know that later I would start a startup. But now looking back 
and the skill sets you need because it's so hard to build a startup. Um, I see what skills makes it more likely to be successful in a startup. And I say that only because this is my third startup. So the, the first two were during the dot-com era in, you know, starting in 1999. Um, so, but now, um, I understand more of what I need. So the first skill you need is to be able to identify a problem that needs to be solved. You know, so how do you even think of an idea? So for me, when I was working and clients kept complaining about why can't you do that, right? So it came from real life. It just wasn't an idea that popped in my head when I was working and in my last job and we grew 800%, you know, by brute force, all of our clients kept complaining about, oh, okay, why are costs rising so high in healthcare? Why does insurance suck? Why don't I really know what's happening? What will cover when I go to the hospital? Why does it only pay for me when I get sick or go to the hospital or I die, right? Why can't you pay for me to be healthy? Um, so that's how I identify a prom, right? Because if people are complaining, it is a prom that everyone wants to be solved. The second thing I discover is even if you have an idea, how do you make it real, right? How do you take an idea to reality? So it's the ability to build. So it I actually discover that the idea is 1% of the solution, 99% of the solution is execution. How do you make an idea real? And for me, I learned those skills from building things from scratch, or I worked for different businesses where they were completely broken and had stopped growing. They were getting smaller and smaller, and I turn them into hyper growth businesses. So it's all about making an idea real. The third thing I learned was that you can't do a startup alone. Otherwise, you're like just a, you know, just, you know, a sold owner, right? In order to build a startup, you have to learn to lead. And what leading means is you have to have followers. You're not a leader unless you have followers. So how do you become someone that people want to follow? And it's not about being the smartest guy in the room and always proving you're right, but the ability to take people on a journey and this journey is like a roller coaster ride because it's highs and lows, right? So anyone can ride the highs. How do you take people through the lows when you're running out of money, when things fail, when clients hate you, right? So how do you actually take a team through this journey, you know, to complete this mission? And you're in a war zone all the time, right? And you're in the trenches. And how do you in the trenches take it to you know completion? So you have to learn to lead other people. The last thing I learned is you have to learn how to sell because you're not only selling to customers to make revenues you're selling to employees to join you on this journey and you're selling to investors to give you money, right? To continue on this journey. So you have to gain a lot of skills. And so if you decide to start something in college, you could be that one in a million that makes it. Yeah. And you can kind of learn these skills on the job, but if you already have these skills going into building a startup, the ability to have an idea, the ability to execute, the ability to lead, the ability to sell, the ability to take teams through the lows, right? And bounce back together, even if there's no hope and you're like falling down the cliff, you have to find a way out. So, um, so I always believe 
your chances of success is if you can gain these skills, but you can gain these skills through clubs, right? You know, internships, right? You know, taking a year off and doing something on the side, you know, so how do you gain these skills and then build your startup? So it, it really is a journey, right? So um, in my third startup, I've accumulated 30 years of building startups and fixing broken businesses. So my chances of success are higher than others. Yeah, so I'm actually, I'm actually really curious. You mentioned the sort of startups that came before CXA and what were some of like the, I, I guess like, the biggest things that you learned out of um, the previous startups. Um, you mentioned how, you know, you have to, you know, you, you can't only ride the highs. You also have to be able to face the lows and overcome those. What were some of like those lows that you encountered and that sort of taught you to become stronger when building CXA or, or taught you some fundamental skills that you didn't know before until you actually faced that um, sort of challenge and difficulty? So um, we've gone through so many periods where you only have a month of salary left <laughs> in the bank <laughs> and <Wow. laughs> you have all these employees you have to pay, right? So what, what do you do, right? You know, so you're scrambling to not pay bills. <laughs> you're scrambling to get your employees to not be paid, right? And, and, and a lot of my employees are not like new college grads. They have families with kids and they could be the sole breadwinner, right? And you're trying to convince them to not be paid for the next three months. <laughs> um, you're scrambling to raise money, right? You're scrambling to get loans. I factor all our invoices from our customers. <laughs> you pay these vulture rates, but you know, you're willing to do that because every single month you're just buying time, right? And you're convincing hundreds of people to not bail on you, right? <laughs> and so, so when you go through these times, there's always a path forward right? And so how do you buy that time to get extra time? And we've, we've convinced clients to give us extra money. So yeah, no, you're, you're really, you know, when you're hand to mouth, right? Month to month sometimes, you have to give hope, even if it feels like there's no more hope while you're scrambling to find a path forward. And at the same time, you're trying to still get clients in because that's revenues. So yeah, no, when you're in a startup, you're really, I mean, it's like you're on this tightrope where any day you can die. But what I found is that there are always valid excuses for every failure. As the founder, how do you become that person that can overcome, you know, seemingly insurmountable odds and those valid excuses of failure, right? So as the founder, you have to be that type of person. So you have to build up that grit and resilience before you face these types of, you know, death challenges, right? Because you're always near death. Yeah, that's a that's a really good way to put it. Um, I see some some of the questions coming in. Uh, we have someone asking, as someone who wants to go into tech plus social good, what tips would you give for how to best serve communities and leverage your startup slash company slash connections to uplift under resourced communities? So. Um... What we do is we, we actually um, are social good too because we're cutting the cost of healthcare and we're getting insurance you know, to the underserved as well as the poor, as well as the working population. So even if it's a social good, you still have to make it work. 
right? So, you know, startups, no matter what, have to find the money to pay their staff or to get volunteers to do this, to do the social good, you know? So it's, it's, it's finding that mission plus making it commercial, right? So you may be able to raise money from the Gates Foundation or others, but you still need to learn these skills. You still have people you have to lead. You still have to get yourself out there. You still have to, have to you know, achieve a social mission. So yeah, achieving a social mission and achieving a profitable mission is not that different. It's building a company from scratch, right? And so you still need the same skill sets. Yeah, um, for sure. I feel like a lot of people sort of have this uh, predefined stereotype that when you go into a startup, all you're trying to do is sort of make a lot of money or something and, and sort of build this unicorn and raise tons of money. But I think a lot of people miss the point that a lot of people who go into startup, like you said, you sort of have this problem in mind that you just want to solve. And whether that is part of a societal issue um, or it has to do with under-resourced communities or it's, you know, a tech issue, like it, people go into their, um, and like you said, like if you're able to keep, I mean, I'm speaking, I, I don't have any experience in this, but like listening to, to you talk, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? To have this sort of uh, to have the mission in mind and to know how to sort of weather the challenges. Um, anyways, I'll stop talking because we have some other questions coming in. Um, and I hope it's okay if we interrupt oh, the, yes, the regular please. schedule of, of topics to just sort of attack these questions real quick. Um, so another person asked, how can you tell if a startup idea is worth pursuing further or is just a sunken cost? So there's a good way to do this. And I didn't do this in 1999 during the dot-com, but I did it the third time. <laughs> so, so I used to think if you build a product, people would, would come. That's what I did in 1999. By, you know, by this time, I learned that you have to have to run those ideas by people who could be potential buyers and get their feedback. So, and you can build a prototype and a prototype could be just PowerPoint, right? So when I left my last company, you know, because they had so many problems and they wouldn't give me $10 million to build the tech. So I spent $10 million. I mean, that's what really happened. So I spent all my family savings, you know, and a loan to build this issue. And so I went back to my ex-clients when I started CXA in my living room and I showed them a prototype and I went to clients who complained a lot, a huge amount. And I went to them and said, if I build this, would you buy it? And I showed them the prototype with PowerPoint. Then they would give me feedback. No, I would do this. I wouldn't do that. You know, come back again. So I took it to the next level and then we built a mock-up, right? And I said, if, this, would you pay me, even if I'm in a startup, I'm no longer running the, the biggest broker in the world and running Asia, if I built this in my living room, would you pay for it? So I got a huge amount of feedback. So don't build a startup in your head, right? <laughs> build a startup and get feedback from potential buyers. So and I ran that idea across three different industry. So I took the largest manufacturer in Singapore. I took the biggest technology company and I went to a financial services company and all three, I gathered feedback and then I built it and they became my first three customers because they fed back all along the way. So yeah. So Get feedback on your startup. Don't build it in isolation at all. I did that in 1999. <laughs> so they won't come unless you're solving a problem that they feel is worth paying for. So when it, when it, actually when it comes to getting feedback, um, do you get 
you mentioned how you get feedback from buyers. Like what sort of the, uh, were, were these people that you knew prior to yes. um, coming up with this project? Okay. Um, yeah, so I can I'm imagine lucky because I've been in a career for a long right. time. Right. Because I can imagine like a situation where sort of you have this product problem in mind, but you sort of don't have the contacts to the people that you want to reach out to, in which case sort of what do you think is like the best way to sort of, like you said, test uh, or, or prototype the, the idea to people? Do you sort of just like cold email people and see if they'll respond yes. in any positive? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, w I mean, look, you're at Harvard, right? And so use your network and use the alumni because the alumni network is huge, right? And figure out some way to get to the right people. And it could even be professors, right? And their network. But the, you guys have the best network available. So leverage it because you have, the thing about selling is you will be rejected all the time. So you have to learn thick skin, right? It's, it's part of learning to be a, a founder. You know, no, no one, no one is going to coddle you, right? So you've got to figure out a way, right? So you have to have thick skin. And so, yeah, it's, it's one of the trainings to be a founder. Every investor, you, you just need that one in a thousand investor to believe in you, but you got to go through those 999 to get to that one. That's true. So these That's are, true. these are, this is like good training. Yeah. For sure. And like you said, it landed you your first three um, customers. So it worked out pretty well too. So, Yes. But they, um, they already trusted me from before. But yet they, when we offer them services, they complain incessantly. Right? So I fixed those problems that they had problems with in my startup that the industry had never solved before. Yeah. So... So that sort of touches upon your, your first uh, advice about like sort of fixing a problem, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's not some idea in my head. It's a problem that needs to be solved. People are right. going, would pay for things that they hate. Right. Yeah. Um, someone else asks, you mentioned raising from Goldman now, but I want to learn more about the early days. So who were you? Who were your seed or Series A investors, and how did you secure them? So in Series A, um, the lead investor um, invested first in a company called Gojek. So they're like this Indonesian giant. It's like the Uber of Indonesia. We were their second investment, you know, after Gojek. So they did a B to C investment, then were the first B to B investment. And I got them um, because I, I actually, um, when I left my last company, I called everyone I knew that was in the investor world. You know, everyone. It's like, okay, would you invest in this type of idea? And so they, through this network, they got me to someone at the head of North Star. And so when I spoke to him, he, he said, hey, you have a lot of experience. Why don't you get on a board for me, right? And, and you know, help me with this startup. And I told him, no, I want to build my own startup. I'm not going to work on your board. <laughs> and, so, and so we kept in touch. Um, and um, he reckoned he was going to put in his personal money but then he started a venture fund and now he runs KKR, a famous investor, right? He runs Asia, the, KK, the Asia office of KKR. So they were my first lead investor. Then the others um, were people I, I, I either worked with, um, I also got my husband's best friends who now make a lot of money. <laughs> Please invest in my wife's business. <laughs> we love so, that. <laughs> look, look, when you're desperate and you're building a startup, Whatever you have to it takes. do this. 
but it was a year after I started my company and we got like the top clients in Singapore. So the only way I was able to raise money is we had traction. So it wasn't an idea anymore. We actually showed that we were able to, to win, you know, big blue chip clients. And I also bought my first company during that year. That's how I spent all my husband and my money. We bought a company. So, and we showed traction. So that's how we did the uh, series A. Series B, my lead investor is a guy named Eduardo Sovereign of Facebook. So he left Facebook um, and he started a fund with BCG, the consulting firm. So they led series B, but I also got the Singapore government. I, I had a lot of other investors. Um, and then we had another round that was led by my clients, HSBC Bank, Aviva, um, Singtel, the largest phone company, right? So each stage, it was led by different people. This series C, Goldman Sachs is the investment bank helping me fundraise. So we're going out to financial and strategic investors. But at each stage, I had to show that we were able to grow and get closer and closer to profitability. Very exciting. So uh, another person asks, what are some traits of the best investors you've worked with and why? And did you ever pitch any of the major ones like Sequoia or um, A166Z? Uh, Andreessen is not here in Asia. Um, Sequoia is in this round, my Series C round. So they're, they're one of many investors. Um, some of the best traits of my best investors are ex-entrepreneurs who have made it. So they're... They're ex-entrepreneurs, they made it, and now they're funding the next generation because those investors can actually help me. You know, because if you have a pure financial investors, they're just look at your numbers. I can read the numbers, right? But if you have an investor who also built their own companies, they actually know what it's like day to day when you have all your oops right? When you're, when you've run out of money, when your clients are screaming at you, right? so when, yeah. when you're trying to open new countries, right? When you're trying to hire the best CTO. So yeah, the best investors actually rise the ups and downs with me and help <laughs> me through these issues and help me fundraise for the next round. Right. So in other words, in 10 years, um, Rosaline would be a great candidate as for an, an investor. Um, so if anyone's starting a startup. <laughs> yes, especially if connect. there's a social impact, right? You know, that's, that's what I yeah. look for. <laughs> awesome. Um, uh, another person asked, who has been the coolest, most interesting person you have met in your startup journey? Um, Obviously yeah. not your husband. <laughs> no, no, no. He's probably the least interesting. <laughs> so, okay. The most interesting is an investor who rejected us. So, um, but he's my mentor right now. He's my advisor. So he's a three time entrepreneur born and raised in Singapore, but his three startups were in the U S. So one went IPO, one was sold to IB, IBM, and the other was a trade sale, right? So three startups, three successes. Wow. So his first one was Match.com, you know, so the first dating app, right? You know, probably in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> so he's here now in Singapore and Indonesia, and he's building another educational startup. He's a philanthropist, plus he's a venture. And when I try to get him to invest in us in series A, we didn't meet his criteria because he, he only invests in startups that is mostly tech. And I started with a startup that was mostly humans that I was trying to digitize. 
right? I was trying to fix the insurance brokerage world, right? And digitize it. So it takes years to digitize. Um, so he's been the most interesting person because he's from Asia, but he made it in the US three times before coming back here to be a VC, philanthropist, you know, entrepreneur, um, and advisor start, you know, building out the startup community here. So, and he does a lot of social good. So he's, he's been pretty amazing. So I always go to him and I tell him, you know, you were right. I should have done what you told me earlier. And so what his first advice to me was, you've hired these rainmakers who are brilliant jerks right? And they bullied all your team, even though they bring in all the revenues. And I told them, but I need them because <laughs> I need <laughs> the revenues. <laughs> but people kept leaving because of them because they were so negative. They took all the credit. They blamed everybody. They were great to clients. They were mean to the staff. And so he was right. I need to get rid of the toxic people because no one wanted to join us if you have these toxic know-it-alls in your firm, mm -hmm. right? Who are really political. So yeah, I'm always going to him and saying, telling him, oh, I should have done it sooner. <laughs> 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 I wish. And now I tell people what he tells me. Yeah. Very cool. Um, and the last question we have here is how do you manage running a startup with your family? You mentioned you were married and one of the things I fear as a female founder is I would have to sacrifice marriage or having children and being a part of a family for my company. Yeah, um, it's so hard. So in 1999, I, uh, through 2001, I built two startups. I was the builder, I wasn't the founder. And I stopped in 2001. I was actually commuting to Kuala Lumpur from Singapore. So every Monday morning at 4 a.m., we would drive five hours to Kuala Lumpur. I would stay there Monday through Friday, come home midnight on Friday. Didn't really sleep during the weekdays. And my kids and my husband were in Singapore. One weekend, I discovered my daughter had epilepsy and a learning disorder. So you can imagine the guilt. My daughter was six, my son was four. So I quit, right? I could not balance my family and my startup. And I just stopped right there and then. Um, of course, my husband didn't stop. He just kept working away because <laughs> he was running a consulting firm called Oliver Wyman, right? He was the Asia PAC leader. You know, he, he moved from New York to Asia. Um, and so at that stage in my life, I couldn't balance family and my, my startups. But I happened to join an insurance company after that who told me I could work four days a week. After, you know, I put my kids in special needs, we fixed the epilepsy, we fixed the learning disorder. And my daughter now works for Microsoft in Seattle. So, you know, and she graduated from Tufts. So I couldn't balance then, but I could balance now because um, my kids are out of college. My husband, after I spent all his money, returned to work, he's no longer retired. <laughs> so that he could pay for the kids' education and rent for us. Um, so I think it's all personal. It depends on what point in your life you are and how you can balance the two. My kids intern for my startups because we started my living room. They both intern for me. My husband helped me in the first found round of fundraising. Um, so my family's been part of my startup, um, life. So I think it's, you, you, you find a way, but at some point in your life, you can't do it all. So now I'm married for 30 years. I just had my 30th year wedding anniversary. My kids are 23 and 25, right? Congratulations. I don't That's know so if cool. they're due a startup or not, but you know, we, we figured out a way to integrate work and family. But at different points in my life, I wasn't able to do that. Yeah, I guess that's also, um, it's also, it, the, the question is also very similar to like, how do you balance like 
college and school with sort of working on a startup, right? Um, and I sort of want to come back to this topic, like, is it, is, is, um, is during college like a good time to start a startup? Um, like I've, I've heard very, like a lot of conflicting opinions on, on this question was curious on what you thought. Yeah, it, it just depends on the idea, right? If that idea, if you have spare capacity and you could build a startup, you know, during college where you could leverage your professors and, and leverage your friends and your classmates, you know, that's great. So I don't think there's ever a best time, right? For, for me, um, it, it was just accumulative knowledge and skills that I learned over time. Right. That's true. So yes, a lot of yeah. people succeed in college, right? That's true. I, I was I was barely getting through school. <laughs> Why did I study engineering? Yeah. <laughs> I changed my major finally to cybernetics where it was yeah, a combination cool. of psychology and engineering, which I like much more. Yeah, maybe I should switch out of engineering as well. <laughs> maybe that's the, the move to success. Um Last question we have here. How did you think about the first 10 hires, your CTO slash CFO, et cetera, since they say your first few hires define the DNA of your team? How do you think about the traits of people that mattered for the culture you wanted to build? Wow, I've had so many learnings on this. Um, so my first hire um, was a specialist in insurance. I needed a specialist. Um, the second hire was a specialist in healthcare because I was trying to go between healthcare and insurance. My third hire was an e-commerce type of expert because I was trying to build an ecosystem, right? So I didn't hire the leaders because who are you leading? There's no one to lead. We just have to build. <laughs> So I didn't hire the CTO, CFO. I hired the worker bees because there's four of us working, right? So there's no one leading anyone else. I was selling. I was trying to get all the ideas, right? And we were building the components. So I only hired the leaders when there were people to lead. I actually first started with what is the product that can solve this problem from the past? And how do I take it from idea to mock-up to prototype to actually a platform that I can sell? So that's how I thought about it. I didn't hire the leaders because, yeah, you know, I don't really need them. I didn't need a CFO because I was self-funding, right? So it was in my living room and I was paying people barely anything. <laughs> so you don't really need someone to do the finances because you have no revenues, you barely have costs, right? Um, and then I hired a CTO later once we knew what we were building. So we had to actually get the concept of the idea more real before I hired leaders. But the types of people that matter, and this is a, like a hard, hard learning. So the types of people that matter are people who can work without structure. If you need structure, because things are changing in a startup all, all the time, um, they have to be able to be really open-minded about listening to ideas. They can't be just wedded to one thing and be super stubborn and I'm always right, right? Because you, you don't know what assumption is, is the one that'll work, right? And they have to be able to move on a dime but they also have to be the types of people who don't get dragged down by discouragement or setback or obstacles or failure, right? You have to be the type of person that actually can bounce back and not react poorly right? <laughs> and be depressed for a long time because you don't have time 
to wallow in your grief and just lament. If you, if you are the type of person that spends all your time lamenting about being a victim and how sad you are and, and it's all, you know, the world's fault, right? You can't make it. So you have to have a bit of an optimistic streak where you're always trying to solve the challenge and to overcome the current obstacles. So that matters more than anything, right? It's not just talent, it's effort and the ability to overcome like, like adversity, right? So that matters. Otherwise, they're just going to bring you down and kill your culture. You don't want a culture of negativity. You want a culture of how do we get over this hump to the other side? How do we do this together, right? So you don't want loners. You actually need people who care about the team and the mission and the journey, right? Who support each other. So it's a hard learning because I made so many mistakes all along the way, which is why I go back to my mentor and say, you were right. You know, we can't afford toxic people. If they're isolated, fine. But when you're four people, you're not isolated, <laughs> right? To go from one to four to a hundred to 300, right? You, you have to get through these stages. Yeah. Awesome. Well, the, the last thing that uh, someone wanted to ask, if there aren't any more questions, which sort of transitions us well to sort of the conclusion here, how can we contact you with further questions, Rosalie? So um, I'm fairly active on social media, uh, especially if you're on LinkedIn or Facebook, you can, you can find me, right? Because um, we find our clients that way too. So we're, we're, fairly, we're fairly public, even though we're a B2B company, we're fairly public. So yeah, no, you, you can always contact us, but I'm, I'm, I am in the midst of fundraising. So find me on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how many, how many meetings do you have a day right now? Oh my God. So I probably have three to four investor meetings every day. Wow. But at least I'm not driving between meetings or flying between meetings anymore. Yeah, you can. You know, you can just hang up and yeah. start the next meeting. So it's really yeah. efficient. It's really, <laughs> really efficient. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, different lifestyle. But uh, yeah, um, so I hope that, that answered um, whoever asked that question. Um, you can find Rosaline on LinkedIn or um, Facebook. I imagine yeah, Facebook, Instagram. whatever people use these days. <laughs> yes, um, yes. Awesome. Well, on that note, um, didn't um, want to take up too much of everyone's time. Also, I think we've gone through a lot of, lot of topics in um, a, a good amount of time. And so thank you so much, Rosaline, for sharing so much of your experience. Um, so, so such insightful advice. And, um, you know, we can continue talking for days on end, but people do have midterms to study for. Um, and so, yeah, like if people have more questions, feel free to um, reach out to Rosaline. Like she said, she does have a lot of meetings right now though. Um, but again, thank you so much Rosaline for, for being with us tonight. A pleasure. Thank you. Good luck everyone on your midterms. <laughs>